Welcome everybody to our live webinar. It is June 24th, Wednesday, and we're here presenting uh, from Massey Bioservices in Prepperell, Massachusetts. We have a pretty big agenda to go over today in our webinar. This is transitioning from non-GMP to off-site GMP storage. So as you listen in, I want everybody to know that you may use the chat feature in the window. And uh, if you wanted to uh, give us any questions, we could address them throughout the webinar or maybe at the end if we have time. We've also attached a handout that you can find in a handouts tab in that same pane. Uh, so feel free to grab that, download it, and you could look at this presentation at your leisure. So as we jump in, I just want to introduce you to our panelists today. We have joining us our Vice President of Quality, Mr. Keith Kelly. I'll be your host for this afternoon. My name is John Orange. I'm the Director of Biorepository Operations. Joining us as well are our Biopharma Storage Product Managers, Burke Bureau, Harlan Bray, and Kaylin AEC. So if you have questions for any of us and want to direct any questions to, to any one of us so you know who we are, uh, feel free to do that in the chat section. We have some information to present to you today on the subject matter. And before we do, we just wanted to launch a quick poll. So if we could all take a time out, maybe answer the poll questions, uh, that would be great. And I'll turn it over to uh, Lisa to, to give the poll. All right, so our first poll question, what do you hope to learn from this webinar? We have three selections there. Understand how GMP guidelines apply to biopharma storage, understand documentation and change control requirements, or what to look for from an off-site biopharma storage provider. We'll give you a minute to answer that question. All right, so we have some answers in here. So our question, what do you hope to learn from this webinar? 29% um, of people answered, understand how GMP guidelines apply to biopharma storage. So great, we'll definitely be talking about that. And 19%, understand documentation and change control requirements. And 52%, the largest answer, what to look for from an offsite biopharma storage provider. Excellent, and John, I'll pass it back over to you. Wow. Thanks, Carlin. And you know what? That was Carlin Bray uh, giving that poll there. So that was my mistake. But, you know, it was it was really great to hear those answers. I was really hoping that we would get a little mix of each question or, um, you know, as the number one topic, because we're really going to cover uh, most of those items on that list, if not all of them, as you'll see by our presentation. So before we can talk about GMP storage from non-GMP storage facility, I think that it's it's noteworthy to explore what what is GMP? Why is GMP storage important? You'll see through this webinar that there's a trending there, there's a trending topic, and and that all revolves around your product safety. When you're looking at product safety and efficacy, you're you're going to pay you're, you're going to pay particular particular attention to things like temperature and humidity. Obviously, you want your product to remain stable as it's being stored somewhere. You want to pay attention to tampering, tamper proofing, and, and you're really looking at the security around your product storage. You don't want anybody to tamper with something that shouldn't be tampered with. Another key component of this aspect would be the labeling process and how you document or keep track of your inventory. And another very uh, important aspect of this is the validation and the monitoring of those controlled environmental areas, those storage areas. Good manufacturing practices, it's a system that products are consistently produced and, I'm sorry, having a little bit of trouble here, and controlled according to quality standards. It's designed to minimize the risks involved in any pharmaceutical production that could be eliminated through testing the final product. And that's as it's worded. I think if we were to take a step back though and begin 
the process at the, the manufacturing level. So you're gonna manufacture product, whether that's API, active pharmaceutical ingredient, uh, some kind of a, a GMP material or a vaccine. Your, your next step is then to store it in a controlled environment. And you're gonna pay particular attention to the safety of that product. You're gonna look at consistent practices and procedures. And to begin that process, you really need a strong foundation. And that strong foundation, uh, I like to look at it and many others in the industry as your quality management system. So without a strong, great quality management system, you really can't, you, you can't depend on the safety of your product or how well it's been stored. You can't trace it. So with respect to quality management systems, I think the best person to speak to those would be our uh, Vice President of Quality, Mr. Keith Kelly. All right, well, thank you very much, John, and thanks to all our attendees today. I appreciate you taking the time to, to be with us and uh, interrupting your day. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that quality management system and what makes a compliant quality management system. It essentially needs to be able to prove that your, your processes were followed and the, the desired results were achieved. So uh, there's a number of things here. There's, there's documentation that helps do that. There's procedures that helps do that. Uh, we'll take a quick talk about both. Uh, under documentation, it's, it's really important that your, your procedures and your important actions uh, have to be documented in some way uh, to capture how they should be performed. Uh, it could be SOPs, uh, maybe simple flowcharts, those sort of things, but there has to be some uh, guidance document written down about how to perform those important steps. Uh, you know, you probably heard the adage, uh, do what you say, say what you do. Uh, it's, it's really important to capture these. And, and the reason for that is you want to avoid having any sort of tribal knowledge in the company. You don't want um, some, you know, something process to, to slowly change and modify over the course of months or years as to how it's uh, been uh, vetted and proven to, to work effectively. You also want to avoid variance between different people. If they're not following the same process, they're adding some variation there as well. So you need these things documented, and those documents then should go through an approval process. That approval process should include the subject matter experts that make sure that the technical content is right, it, it's helping with that. And there should also be a uh, quality approval to make sure that it's meeting any compliance requirements and so forth. And it's also really important to have a revision history so you can track over time what has changed in those procedures. So if you need to go back to, well, 18 months ago, how was this done? You can get there and understand how it was being performed at an earlier state. Or when you're going to release a new version, you should be going back to your revision to make sure you're not undoing something that you've uh, purposely put into that process to, to avoid uh, potential mistakes. Once you've got these documents created, uh, the next thing you need to do is make sure that your distribution is right. Most people think of you know, the controlled distribution of making sure there's only the most current version available and, and really restrictive as to um, what information is available. So they're making sure the right information is available uh, to, to the employees. And that certainly is a big part of distribution. The other uh, side of that though, is distribution should also be looking to make sure that these documents and procedures are available at point of use. There's no sense in having a great process documented uh, and then make it difficult for someone to actually access it and use it. So you want to make sure that they're both controlled to make sure people have the right current information and they're available through distribution. <clears throat> now, once people are actually doing these processes, uh, they need to do some record keeping. And the, these records are really important. They're going to be your objective evidence to support the process results, to make sure that those processes did, in, in fact, uh, it happened, they were followed, and they gave you the proper results. So uh, your, your partner here with uh, storage should have uh, record keeping policies that talk about good documentation practices, you know, indelible ink, so things can't, you know, no using pencil, that sort of thing. Uh, they should describe how errors are to be corrected and annotated to make sure you, you don't lose any important information. 
uh, and they should have a record retention policy that says how long these records need to be kept. Because again, if you need to go back to something 18 months or two years from uh, in the back, looking back in history, you need to make sure that uh, those necessary records are gonna be available for you to, to review and access. And all of this is, is sort of covered through an umbrella uh, program called a data integrity program. The FDA has been really strong about um, pursuing the companies invoke a data integrity program uh, over the last few years. And the industry standard is they, they have an acronym they use, ALCOA, A-L-C-O-A, uh, and that sort of defines some of the, the, the key features that need to be covered in uh, your partner's data integrity program. The A is for attributable. So when somebody is recording information, we want to know for sure who that was, when they were recording it. Uh, if somebody is uh, making a, an addition or a modification or something like that, we need to know who that was that was making that and when they did it. The L is for legible. Obviously, you need to be able to read this information, uh, but that's not just uh, handwritten information, maybe in a checklist or filling out a form like that. We're also talking about electronic information as well, electronic data. So if you have a program that's collecting some critical data and it's kind of an unusual program, you want to make sure that data is saved in a format that you'll be able to read uh, now and in the future so you can access that data. Uh, the C is for contemporaneous. It's really important that this data is captured at the time of observation or at the time of execution. That is when you know that data is correct. You can't wait and, and fill, it, fill it out at the end of the day or anything like that. It's a really uh, important aspect of the data collection. O is original, and that means they want to be, have the source data available uh, and, and preserved. So again, if you know if there's some modifications going on, you can't obliterate or throw away the, the old data and just keep on to the new data. You need to keep that source data, that original data. And the A is for accurate. So yeah, that, you know, this is a quality system. Obviously, we want accuracy. So the data should be free from errors. And uh, again, any sort of corrections or edits that are made are are explained and identified uh, who made those. And actually in the last few years, uh, they've added a few more characteristics to a good data integrity program. Uh, they want your data to be complete, make sure it has all of the information that you need to collect, that it's consistent. And what they're looking at here is like, if there's a supporting metadata, uh, they're referencing the same units, the same name, the same lots, that sort of thing. Sequential timestamps, that's all very important. Uh, enduring, they want the data to be able, that's recorded to be, to last. Uh, if you've ever had some of your uh, sales receipts from a supermarket or something that uses thermal paper, you know, you know, eight months down the road or let it sit on the dashboard for, for a couple of days and you can't read that anymore. So, you know, thermal printouts are not a good choice in a GMP environment. And uh, available, so they want to make sure people, you know, you can't just gather this data, walk it up tight, put it away somewhere and, and make and never be able to access it again. It needs to be available uh, for review. So there are certain components that people will build into their uh, data integrity program. You have your usual things like antivirus and malware protection to make sure there's no external impacts to that data integrity and that data um, legibility and accuracy. Uh, they want password policies so that you can make sure that when somebody signs a document, you know it was them. Uh, they are looking for validated software to make sure that, that any of the data that's being collected automatically through an electronic system is it's actually capturing the correct data. And then all of that data should be backed up, uh, have a backup plan and a recovery plan. So they want you to make sure you can access that data and read that data periodically to make sure, should you need it, it's there someday for you. A few of the key procedures that a uh, quality system has to have to be GMP compliant, certainly one of the, the top ones in my mind is a good change control process. And the purpose of the change control is to prevent mistakes from, from happening or from missing steps or from unintended consequences when you go to make a change. So there should be steps to any change control program. It should start out with the change is identified, it's documented, it's then assessed, 
uh, by subject matter experts. It gets approved before the execution. And there should also be a review after it's all said and done to make sure there were no unintended consequences from that change. Uh, change control should cover not only the, the processes that you might be changing, but uh, any of your uh, equipment or critical utilities that are being used to store that product. Uh, and that includes software and computers. And part of that change control process should be uh, an effort to identify risks. So risk management uh, and uh, risk mitigation should be part of every change control process. Now, as good as change control is at making sure mistakes don't happen, mistakes do happen, they can happen. So you need to have a strong deviations program. And that's, you know, so when something goes wrong, you have a process in place to address that. And it's sort of a, a similar idea. First, you need to identify it. Then you need to investigate it. You can use your, your standard quality tools like five wise, fishbone diagrams, cause and effect diagrams, depending on what works for the, the type of investigation you're doing. But ultimately, your investigation is to determine what that root cause was. What is the one thing that if you fix it, will make sure that that, a mistake doesn't happen again. The next step is to take corrective action. So you want to fix that, that root cause from ever happening again. And then much like change control, after a certain length of time, you want to go back and verify effectiveness. So you want to make sure that you did identify the root cause and the, and the corrective action you implemented was successful at uh, preventing that from happening again. So in both of these processes, if you kind of look at them, you know, identify, investigate, take action, verify effectiveness, uh, it's sort of like the, the plan, do, check, act cycle that is very uh, familiar for anyone from my age, at least, of, of uh, the quality background, you know, sort of the cornerstone of the quality revolution. Uh, you know, make your plan, um, do something about it, check that it's effective, and so forth. Um, another component that's really important is supplier management. And you know you might be thinking, well, I'm, I'm working with my offsite uh, storage facility. How they handle their suppliers is their problem, but that, that's not really the case. You you want to make sure that the product and services that your partner here is using meets their requirements. That they've got a good process in place because if, if they are getting uh, inferior product or services, that's ultimately going to impact the your product as well. So they should have a, a, a qual, uh, supplier qualification process. They should have a list of the qualified suppliers and what they are qualified for. Not only that they, they've been approved, but what, what are the activities or items that they've been approved for. And these uh, suppliers should have a periodic review to make sure that uh, they're, they're still within qualification and the performance review of how have they done over the last year or two years or whatever your, your cycle is. Uh, there should be a way to, uh, for the storage provider to handle supplier issues. There might be uh, something they call SCAR, Supplier Corrective Action Request, but there should be a mechanism in place so that when a problem arises, there is a way for the storage uh, facility to work with their supplier to resolve that. And ultimately, if they can't resolve it, uh, the supplier program should have a way of removing that, for that uh, supplier and making sure that they don't accidentally get used again in the future. And the last thing that I want to touch on here are continuous improvements. And the reason that this is, is such an important uh, aspect for your, for your partner in storage is these are the things that are going to drive the innovation, drive the efficiencies, and uh, you know, uh, improve their performance. Uh, and that's the sort of company that you want to be partnering with, one that it, gets better, gets stronger, uh, and, and has the, uh, the wherewithal and understanding to incorporate the best new practices within the industry. And actually, a good continuous improvement uh, program can also be really helpful in addressing negative trends. If there's something that isn't quite right, but there's no one uh, specific thing identified, a good continuous improvement program can help you do that, identify those. And you know, these changes don't all have to be dramatic. They can come in either small incremental changes. So there are things that are, you know, just uh, bumped month after month in a particular process or paperwork or, 
or um, activity that, that you know gradually improves a little bit of improvement month over month over month, or they can be breakthrough improvements. They might be something like Kaizen events where they decide there's something that really needs to be addressed and um, they're, they're gonna put the effort and the uh, investment into addressing that problem and aggressively solving it. Um, so those are some of what I consider some of the critical components to a, to a good GMP compliant quality management system. And uh, I'll turn it back over to you, John. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, I think it's, it's obviously imperative when considering GMP storage facilities to, to make sure that these things are in place. Ultimately, uh, GMP storage facilities and extent of your manufacturing process it's it's the it's what's going to safeguard your product until it gets to the final mile and there's a saying in the industry i'm sure everybody in this webinar right now has heard of it if it's not documented it never happened and you certainly want to make sure that you have those procedures and documentation in place and what does it mean when you get to a storage facility a GMP storage facility, you need to keep good records of your inventory. So I'd, I'd like to call upon Kaylin AEC to speak on behalf of uh, keeping inventory. Kaylin. Hi, thank you, John. I appreciate it. So inventory practices are critical to your operation. Let's face it, you've created this amazing product that you want to get to market on time. And if you don't have clear, validated processes in place, that could affect your timeline. So Keith Kelly did an amazing job of walking you through the GMP documentation and procedures and why they're put in place to safeguard your products. This also falls in line with your inventory. No matter where you are in the inventory process, if you are at R&D, testing, production, finished good, bottom line is you need to understand what you have in inventory. You need to know where is your inventory, what the status of your inventory is, is it quarantined, is it released, is it expired, how much of each item do you have? Something else you need to think about is where is your material kept? Is it kept overseas? So you have that for your planning processes of knowing how quickly you can get your material back to you. And this can be very challenging when you bring in several third parties into your industry for your inventory management. If you're using multiple testing sites or multiple CMOs, or multiple offsite storage locations, let's face it, they're all gonna inventory your, uh, they're gonna manage your inventory a little bit separately. And that's actually okay because they're either using their own different uh, software systems that they could have set up in place, they could have their own reporting procedures that they have in place, they could just be using different headers, they could have unique identifiers that they're using in their inventory that you don't necessarily need, but they need for their information. And again, these items are okay because with the GMP, you've actually worked with these vendors. So you've provided the, the vendors with the information that you need for your inventory. So they have all that information. And even though the reports that you might be getting back from these different third parties look a little bit different, the key information that you need is there and available to you. And basically, I think one of the key things for managing inventory across your, your suppliers is consistency. The more consistency you have is going to make your ability to track your inventory that much better. I think a nice easy example to think about is let's just say you're storing at two different offsite storage locations. You're storing the exact same product. Are you doing that consistently at both pro at both locations? For instance, are you having one supplier just inventory at the vial level and the other supplier is inventorying just at the box level? What about the inventory methods that you're using at each offsite place? Are you using FIFO for one and LIFO for the other? Or how are you also managing your, your shipping materials? Is one of your locations managing your shipping materials and the other one isn't? So these are critical things that you wanna understand and make sure that you've got this consistency across because it's gonna help you track your, your inventory much easier. And you can streamline these processes very simply with the GMP processes put in place. One of the key questions I get all the time in the storage industry is, how do you know what you have in inventory? How can you prove what you have in inventory? And for me, that's actually really easy to answer. And the reason why is because we have GMP policies put in place for that. 
we do have the validated and documented processes to confirm what we're reporting we have in inventory is actually what we do have in inventory. So I would suggest when you're looking for your third party vendors for their GMP policies, there's some key things that you wanna be taking a look at. You definitely wanna make sure that they have the documented policies and procedures in place. Basically everything that Keith Kelly just went into, those are critical for your success. You also want to ensure that they have a validated software system. This is going to provide the traceability that you need while your products were in their location. Um, something else you need to have is the validated incoming and outgoing shipping records. Something else to think about is the secure system. So the inventory system that they're using, you want to make sure that they have systems in place to secure that information, whether it's password protection, uh, you don't want unauthorized access, so you only want the key people that should be doing that having access to that. You also want a clear inventory audit trail that meets your regulatory requirements. And something that I think is fantastic that you should require of all your vendors is have virtual access to your inventory. So as you know, unfortunately, when your material is off-site, you can't just walk down the hallway, open up the chamber, and actually look at your product. But when you can see it virtually, that's the next best thing. And what's great about that is you have basically told the vendor everything that you need to see for your inventory. So if you needed to record the unit of measure or how much or the expiration date, lot numbers, any information like that, you can actually see it. You can't touch it, but you're able to see it, which is the next best thing. So having these GMP items in place is going to give you the peace of mind that your inventory requirements are accurate. And with that, I'll turn it back over to John Orange. Thanks, Kaylin. You know, another question that seems to come up, not only where's my product now, but where has my product been? So if you trace the movement of your product throughout its life cycle at a storage facility, you don't just want to know where it's at in a snapshot of time. You also want to see that it's been in controlled locations. And if you need to correlate that to monitoring trends, it's it really is just making sure that you are maintaining the safety of your product. Again, it's a trending topic that we keep touching on. So thanks very much, Kaylin. I think right now we have another time for a quick poll. If we just take a time out and there will be a poll that gets launched. Carla or Lisa? The, I'm um, sorry. <laughs> the question is what's most important to you? when looking for off-site storage. So if we can maybe take a couple of minutes, maybe not minutes, but some quick time. Couple more seconds here. Okay, it looks like we are we're good. So if we could share those poll results, I can't see right, them. John, so. I can go over those uh, answers for you. So our question yeah, was no most important to you when looking for an offsite storage provider. Um, so 10% of our attendees answered price. 10% of attendees answered available storage capacity, 30% answered range of available conditions, and 35% answered documentation and use of GMP. And then the last 50% answered not sure. I'll pass it right back over to you. Thank you. So that's 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 a good uh, that's a good topic. I think that there's a there's a number of um, discussion points there. I think that. I think the next slides are going to speak to a couple of those and uh, for whatever we don't cover we can we can probably cover at the end but range of conditions that's certainly something that you really get to i see a lot of that start coming into play when you when you start talking about stability when you need to from one temperature humidity condition to another uh and when you're looking at cold chain supply also now you're looking at the myriad of 
uh, ranges that you have to choose from. So from my perspective, I think one of the, the big things is the flexibility of those ranges. You know that a chamber, uh, an environmental storage chamber could do a lot of different things. It could be used at many different ranges, but you got to make sure that those ranges are validated and not just validated, but you want to look for precision performance too. So we'll touch on those. I think now that we've established the, the foundation of having a good quality management system and what that means from the perspective of capturing inventory and keeping records, data intake. Now let's look at another aspect of choosing a GMP facility or, or going from a non-GMP storage to a GMP storage facility. There's some pretty key things to consider and I'll turn this part over to Burke Bureau who can expand a little more on this. Burke. The requirement of a GMP facility that you're looking for sometimes is hard to define. GMP is not a document, it's a, a system that people are looking at. So when you ask the question, are you GMP of a provider, their answers may be yes, um, but you have to qualify that. One of the most important thing is all the equipment that's being used, uh, have the products been the equipment been validated and calibrated. If it hasn't, it's not GMP. They need to be able to prove that they've done that and have the documentation to back that up. Uh, depending on where you go, your different size facilities, um, the typical freezer farm will have multiple uprights. Uh, for them to be GMP, they obviously have to be monitored, but you really need to have uh, the ability to Protect the product that's in it. You do that multiple layers, layers of redundancy. Upright uh, chambers often will have uh, a duplicate backup that's running empty in case there's a failure of the upright. Um, alternatively, some uprights have the ability to have a do a CO2 or a liquid nitrogen attached to it. So if there is a power failure, those systems will maintain the cold inside it. For companies that have the larger uh, walk-in systems, uh, like Massey, um, you're really looking for dual cooling systems that are independently capable of maintaining temperature within the range that's specified. Uh, obviously, they also have to have the backup systems to make sure that if a compressor goes down, there's a backup compressor that will be able to uh, switch over and take over or alternate cooling system to do that. Um, you have to monitor what's going on. Non-GMP facilities often will just use the control monitor that's built into the system. GMP requires an independent monitoring system. A single point uh, temperature is not advisable. You really want to find out from the potential provider whether they have multiple sensors in each condition so that they have a record of the entire chamber, not just a midpoint. Many companies will use the mapping exercise during uh, equipment qualification to determine the high temperature point, low temperature point, and median point, and have sensors there. Monitoring system needs to be able to alert you when there's a problem. Uh, again, a single way to alarm, uh, announce an alarm is probably not particularly safe. You want to have the alarm get out to the response team multiple ways. Uh, obviously, a landline is the most logical, but with now cell and cable, you could have multiple ways that the alarm team can be contacted and be confident that a telephone pole coming down isn't going to eliminate the ability for your team to respond. Um, all of the equipment has to be uh, set up so that the alarms are at functioning um, at all times. Uh, a good practice is to be able, be able to alert the team that the alarming system is actually functioning. And the, the no news is good news is not the case with alarm systems, monitoring systems, or chambers. Overall, 
all you have to be prepared for failures. Um, liquid nitrogen is, is used by many as a backup for the compressors for cooling systems. So if you don't have to open the door, you could put liquid nitrogen in to maintain temperatures. Uh, you're doing uh, the, probably the best thing. Ultimately, you have to plan for failure. You have to have resources assigned to be able to respond to failures. You have to have procedures in place that describe how things are supposed to be done and who's supposed to do them. So it's uh, critically important to practice things that could go wrong so that you can have a response and be comfortable. Uh, your vendors should be able to prove that they have uh, emergency response plans in place and be able to provide information to you on how they would handle your product in a situation that requires uh, immediate movement. I think that covers a lot of the things. Thank you, Burke. Planning for failure I think is, is a really good way to put it because you're demonstrating that you have a robust practice, a fluid mechanism when an emergency does happen. It's just like when you do a fire drill and everybody goes to a muster point, you are training yourself to react in the event of an emergency and those things happen. And you know that they don't, but in the event that they do, you know exactly what to do. So redundancies, as Burke was pointing out, it's it, it all revolves around product safety. If it fails, what system will take over and keep your product safe? So as you can see in the picture, you might want to consider things like redundant backup systems with your uh, uh, chambers, your storage chambers, maybe backup uh, generators or backup. That's those are the questions you got to ask. Is is what? What kind of backup, what redundancy do you have? And the storage facility, the conditions aren't the only redundancies you should look for to keep your product safe. You also want to look at, I'd like Carl and Bray to chime in on security components of a GMP storage facility. Carlin. Great, thank you, John. And Mark, that was some great information on redundancies. So one of the biggest differences when you transition from storing a material in a non-GMP environment, for example, in your research lab, to an off-site GMP storage facility is security. So as Burke just discussed, redundancies are very important to keeping your product safe. But um, to tamper-proof your product, um, it's very important to have a high level of security at the off-site storage facility. Um, in my experience at Massey, my years here, I've toured many uh, research labs, pharmaceutical companies, um, and in some instances, there's a large amount of employees that can access the material they're storing. Um, but when you do transition to an off-site off uh, GMP storage facility, your valuable material, your, your material you've been working on for years, your baby, it's, um, it can't just be accessed by anyone. It's very, very different. Um, so at GMP storage facilities, they're a very safe environment. So someone walking by can't just open a door and pull product out and run off with it. Um, these are very highly regulated environments. Um, so usually these facilities, the GMP offsite facilities, um, it'll be a secure facility, a secure building, which is very common in, in the industry with pharmaceutical companies. Um, but there's also multiple layers of security as well. So the actual area where um, someone is storing the material, that is usually secure as well, in addition to the building being secure. Um, so only a limited number of employees can actually access that part of the facility. Um, and then in addition to that, there's even more layers of security. So the actual chamber door where the material is being stored, that is normally secure as well and should be secure. If you're looking for off-site GMP storage, make sure all those levels are there. That should be a red flag for you if you don't see all of those multiple layers of security. Um, oftentimes, the material will be monitored by cameras. Um, so of course, this is commonplace in research labs and pharmaceutical companies, but at an off-site GMP facility, the cameras will be, um, will be a lot more cameras. There'll be cameras on every single chamber door. There'll be cameras um, throughout the entire facility. So this is a great security measurement because if anything ever happens with the product, if it's ever um, you know, misplaced, you'll be able to go back and look at that footage. You'll be able to see the exact date, 
time when that product was moved, who moved it? You can see the exact employee who moved the product. You can see the material being moved. So it's full traceability to a much, much further extent. Um, and just generally speaking, in my experience, what triggers most um, folks that I, that I help out, most pharmaceutical companies to transition to offsite GMP storage is that they have this very, very valuable material. Um, I've gone into facilities where they're storing $250,000 worth of material in one uh, standalone freezer. Um, so they store that offsite in a GMP environment. So they have that peace of mind. They know there's securities, there's multiple layers of uh, camera security, badge access, and there's full traceability. So they have that peace of mind going forward that their valuable life's work that could take years to replace, that could take a million dollars to replace. They know that that's safe and secure. And uh, with that, John, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Carlin. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of work that goes into it. There's a lot to set up. And at a GMP facility, you don't really have different levels of GMP. It's, it's GMP, all of it. And to Burke's point, the way that you're responding from a monitoring perspective, the way the facility is treated, preventative maintenance to keep your systems robust and active so they don't break down, security measures in place, all of it needs to be a working fluid system. Obviously, one of the most important aspects of choosing a good GMP facility is looking for precision storage control. Now, when I say precision, this, this graph right here, uh, when you review your storage facility and you review the validation documents or the temperature uniformity, you want to choose something that has some kind of precision, enough to where you feel that your product is safe. And when you see a graph of uh, temperature from a validation report or monitoring that seems to oscillate all over your temperature range, you may want to think twice about whether or not your product is experiencing more variability than you'd like. Because at the end of the day, when you're trying to produce consistent results in your medicine or your material or product, you need to treat that product or material consistently throughout its life cycle. So when you look for precision and you're looking at a two to eight degree refrigerator, for example, uh, you probably don't want something that is, is all over the map. Uh, you probably want to consider how tight that, that range is controlled because now as things come up, you have different seasonal extremes, especially if you're looking at a warehouse facility, you have different changes to the ambient temperature and humidity that may impact the mechanical performance of your uh, storage equipment. Uh, you want there to be enough room to where the chamber might be able to adapt a little bit to those changes and still be well within your qualified range. Again, choosing the best, safest option for your product is probably one of the most key things. These are all key components uh, to consider when you're going from non-GMP to GMP. Uh, you know, to say that one of these building blocks is, is more important than the others, I could make arguments all day long, but at the end of the day, they all need to come together as one and give you the blanket of security that you need to have with your product. I mentioned previously the last mile, the final mile as I hear it all throughout the industry. So when you're creating a GMP product, you manufacture it, now you need to store it in an environment that's safe and maintain that safety all the way until it's so it's delivered until it's a final destination, which could be at a pharmacy, could be at a distribution center or the patient. You need to maintain that level of documentation, that control, that traceability, and that temperature uniformity all the way to that doorstep. That's what we consider to be the final mile. So that you know that you're taking the same medicine every single time that that active ingredient is gonna be of the same potency, the same consistency, that it's not gonna denature or fall apart because of the variability. So at the end of the day, you gotta do what's best for your product, keeping it safe, keeping it consistent, all the way to the final mile, paying attention to temperature control, continuous monitoring, tampering, labeling, 
everything all together and ultimately making the right decision for your product. Are there any questions? Looking at the questions panel, anybody have any questions to fire off the panel? Or from the audience, John, I can read to you. Um, one directed towards Kaylin. The question is, how do costs differ between non-GMP and GMP storage? Kaylin, I don't know if you want to address that. Thank you. My apologies. I was still muted. My apologies. Actually, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, I think you've learned a lot in the presentation today. You see what goes into the GMP storage and all the different aspects of it. So you've got everything from a robust quality system. You've got document and procedures in place. You have redundancies. You have backup policies. You have validated inventory systems, controlled inventory systems. You have trained personnel, you have security, you have um, chambers that have been calibrated, validated, monitored. So all this goes into the GMP process. So, you know, obviously it will affect your price a little bit, but if you think about it this way, that if we're doing that and we're managing that for you, that frees you up, right? So now if you're worried about running out of inventory space, so if you're looking at having to buy additional chambers, we have the additional storage for you. Or if you get that call at three o'clock in the morning that something's wrong with your chamber, those are all value-added services that we provide for you. And with that, that's kind of built in what, with, the, with the cost, with a little bit of difference between the non-GMP and the GMP pricing. Um, so, Kaylin, just to, just to chime in on that note, that was good points. Um, really, when, when you look at the what goes into the GMP storage, a major component of it and, and part of the setup is validation and monitoring. And validation is really ensuring that your system can maintain performance consistently. If you were to test it today, if you were to test it a month from now, two months from now, or two years from now, that it's gonna maintain consistently over time and that, that you meet the performance specifications of your environment. But, but it is a snapshot in time, whether that's a week or a day or however long you're performing your validation for. Outside of that, you wanna look for a good robust monitoring system because after validation is, is done and gone and now you have a nice report, it's robust and you're happy with it, great. But you wanna be able to react, as Burke was saying before, to any kind of an emergency that comes up. If you see variability in your graph over time, you need also a very good monitoring system. So, so those are some of the things that go into that go into what Kaylin was talking about too. So thanks for that. Uh, Great. I have another question, John, um, to you. The question is: Are there control temperature shipment options available? And I assume that's um, talking about Mossy particularly, but maybe speaking in general as well. Yeah, so being in the buy repository, I see a lot of different things go. Uh, we we ourselves have a have a lot of different options, but out there in the uh, in the industry, you also I just mentioned validation and monitoring in that final mile. Well, not always is the final mile. You're you're going from the manufacturing facilities to a storage GMP storage facility or back and forth. And you also need to maintain that temperature throughout the transit. So whatever, wh whether that's in vessels or a refrigerated truck, those need to be validated and monitored throughout the transit. So yeah, you, you definitely wanna look, uh, I think the common ones that I see, you have ambient shipping containers or trucks, uh, that, that's pretty common, but controlled ambient is is really what I'm talking about. You also have uh, five degrees Celsius, which is pretty common. That's your two to eight degree C range. It's very, very common, very common. You have minus 80 shippers, uh, and you know, whether or not that's packed with dry ice, dry ice sublimates at you know, minus 78-ish, uh, and, and you have a specific pack out. And so, you know, do you just dump dry ice in? No, you, you need to validate a specific pack out. 
that's shown to, to that's proven to hold temperature for up to a couple of days or what have you. And uh, you do have very common as well as liquid nitrogen doers or um, shippers. So they, they you need to precondition them and that is also a validated procedure. But um, you can't just take stuff out of cryogenic conditions, put them in a box and ship them. You want to maintain the temperature the whole way through the transit. So there, there, there are a lot of different options for controlled transport. Thanks. Great. Um, I have another question just came in from the audience. Is Mossy registered with the FDA or has Mossy ever been inspected by the FDA? That's a that's a good question. I'll let our VP of Quality take that one, Keith. Ah, uh, yeah, a uh, really good question. Uh, for Massey, we have not been inspected by the FDA, uh, although we have asked them to to come to our facility and perform that task. Um, they're really focusing most of their efforts on the manufacturing facilities and the labeling and distribution facilities. So that's where their big focus is. Uh, however, uh, there is a, always a caveat that uh, anytime they are investigating one of our customers, one of our clients and following a particular uh, product through its life cycle, uh, there's always the opportunity for, for them to come and, and visit the facility, the storage facility, whoever it is, to uh, you know, qualify that facility to make sure it is truly GMP, because uh, it's a requirement that uh, you know these manufacturers, if they even if they do store it offsite at a third party, that third party still has to meet those requirements. So uh, it's uh, the FDA usually doesn't go and audit the facilities, storage facilities themselves directly, but they will uh, often get there through following a particular uh, product line, especially if there's some sort of a, a new drug application or something like that. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and Keith, uh, uh, also one, one thing that I just thought of as you were talking there is uh, we, we do maintain an FDA inspection ready uh, atmosphere. We're, we're very much prepared uh, for the audits or inspections uh, because honestly, I mentioned before in the in the presentation that we're, we're somewhat of an extension of the manufacturing facilities, we're storing the products. So uh, we anticipate that one day we'll, we'll get a knock on the door, it'll be the FDA, and um, you know we're, we're, ready to, uh, we're ready to conduct that inspection with them. Great, right. um, another one just came in about deviations in stored product. Um, how soon would a customer be notified of a deviation that potentially impacts stored product? Why don't I grab that one too, John? Yeah, um, go for it. So for, for our facility, it's within one business day. Uh, whatever you're looking for, remember, when you're looking at off-site storage, you're not, don't think of it as, you know, just uh, buying services or something like that. You are partnering with somebody. Uh, this, is, this is an agreement that you are going to partner with these people. They're going to take as much care of your product as you would uh, yourself if you were storing it locally. So you want to make sure that you have an agreement with them that as soon as uh, something goes wrong, they're going to let you know. So in our in our case, we uh, we have a one business day uh, policy written into our SOPs. Customers must be notified within one business day if there is a, a deviation that could impact their product. So, uh, and you definitely want to have wording like that in your quality agreement with these these companies and we really didn't talk about quality agreements but but you, you should have a quality agreement with your um your your storage provider to make sure that it's covering all of these things that we've talked about in this uh conversation it's one thing to talk to them about it but it's another to get it into a contract you want all of that covered in your quality contract great um keith there's another question for you actually <laughs> while we're chatting um the question is how frequently should chamber validations be performed that's a question i've asked myself quite a bit we've put a lot of time and effort into uh researching that thinking about that um and don't turn out as soon as i say it depends <laughs> it does depend uh but you know there's a lot that goes into it the uh equipment performance the, the quality of the equipment the history uh behind that type of equipment 
what sort of continuous monitoring systems in place? Is it a good, robust system that's been giving you indications of variations in performance and not just outright failures? You know, single point monitoring versus multi point monitoring. Uh, do the units receive regular preventive maintenance, you know, monthly or, or uh, you know, quarterly or something like that? So um, the the FDA itself does not specify or recommend a specific frequency. So you really need to have your your partner, your your storage facility, do a risk assessment. They should do a, a formal documented risk assessment that takes into account all of those things, you know, the, uh, the monitoring systems, the, the PMs, the uh, performance of the units and so forth, and is able to justify whatever they determine is the appropriate uh, interval for, for uh, re requalification. Having said all of that, there are some typical industry numbers, somewhere between three to six years, and you're, you're pretty much in the norm of what's out there in the industry, but uh, there is no specific requirement, uh, specific uh, dates or, or frequencies given, uh, only that you should be addressing it and, and really you want to have a, some sort of formal documentation to, to rely on to justify the, the, uh, the interval that you pick. Great. We have time for one more question. I just got another one from the audience. Actually, um, the question is, how important is proximity to the customer's manufacturing sites? Yeah, that's, um, well, I, I guess that depends on what your risk mitigation plan is. If, um, I mean, you, you look at convenience and you look at whether or not, uh, you know how close you need your facility with respect to getting your product um you know it's uh in some cases you're looking at well if you're right down the road then if we need if we need some of our overflow storage then it's not going to take long to make its way to you but also when you look at a, disa a potential disaster uh whether or not that be a natural disaster or something something else happening um you may want to consider distance also so it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, something that's extremely close to you, but but also what do you do if, and, and we talked a little bit about this in our uh, presentation with uh, planning for that failure, planning for emergencies. Um, so I, I think that they're all good things to consider. Um, maybe open it up to uh, uh, Keith or uh, I know Carlin uh, maybe had some information on this too. Uh, you guys wanna chime in? Uh, I, I think it's really going to depend a lot on, on what the product is that's being stored and what your intended use is, uh, how frequently how frequently you, you want access to it, and you know you're going to be adding more, taking some away. If uh, you know if it's retains or it's something that you are just going to be storing for six months, three months, whatever, uh, and it's a you know just a, a simple shipment out there, one shipment that's going to sit farther away doesn't matter because ultimately, you know, the travel time you can account for in the proper packaging and validated shipping processes and so forth. So that, that distance isn't a problem. If you're thinking you're going to, you know, want to be uh, getting product in and out and in and out uh, frequently from it, then uh, having a facility that's close by that might even be able to offer delivery for you, pick up and delivery, would be a, a huge benefit over having to schedule all of these things through some sort of, you know, uh, uh, FedEx custom critical or something like that. If you, if your facility was close enough and offered pickup and delivery services, then uh, there's a there's a huge advantage for you there uh, if you're going to be moving the product back and forth pretty frequently. Yeah. Thanks, Keith. Um, so yeah, I think. We're just about out of time. I think there was a lot of good information that we covered here. I just wanted to throw out because we did talk about validation and monitoring. I think that there's a lot of good uh, questions that could come out of that or a lot of good information to learn from that because uh, we've only just scratched the surface of uh, GMP storage. There's a lot that goes into it, uh, but it, you know, in particular, when you look at monitoring and ongoing support from a monitoring perspective, uh, you may want to uh, tune in for our next webinar, which will be uh, one of our next webinars, actually. It'll be for monitoring, um, and that's going to be July 22nd. 
so if you're interested in, in learning more about that, definitely tune in for that. But uh, I think that now being out of time, I'd like to turn it over to Lisa and uh, or Amy to um, maybe wrap things up. Thank you. All right, thank you, John. Thank you, John. Um, thank you everybody for attending. I just want to uh, remind everyone that the presentation is available in your handout section, so download that um, if you'd like. And also keep an eye out in your emails. You will get a recording of this session, um, so if you'd like to review it, it will be there in your emails. So I'd like to thank all of our panelists. You did a great job. That was some great information. And everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, folks.